Hello, everyone. Um, if you're still grabbing food, uh, feel free to do so. I just figured we should uh, start now um, in order to secure some time at the end for a robust like Q&A session. Um, so also on a side note, if you do have questions, I mean, you can raise your hand, but try hold them until the end uh, so we can have more of a Q&A discussion um, at the end. Uh, so today we have a very popular speaker, um, Dr. Awesome Padella. Uh, Dr. Padella is the director of the Initiative on Islam and Medicine, assistant professor of medicine in the section, section of emergency medicine, and a faculty member at the McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. He holds an MD from Wheel Cornell Medical College, completed his residency in emergency medicine at the University of Rochester, and received the master's in healthcare research from the University of Michigan. His Islamic studies experience comes via a Bachelor's of Science in Classical Arabic from the University of Rochester, seminary studies during his formative years, and continued tutorials with Islamic authorities throughout his career. Dr. Padella is a clinician, researcher, and a bioethicist whose scholarship lies at the intersection of community health and religion. He, he utilizes diverse method methodologies from health services research, religious studies, and comparative ethics to examine the counter of Islam with, with contemporary biomedicine through the lives of Muslim patients and clinicians and in the scholarly writings of Islamic authorities. Through systematic research and strategic interventions, he seeks to improve American Muslim health outcomes and healthcare experiences and to construct a multidisciplinary sorry about that, field of Islamic bioethics. As a Robert Woods Johnson uh, Foundation clinical scholar from 2008 to 2011, he developed a community-based research methodology to study and intervene upon American Muslim health disparities. Then in 2011, as a visiting fellow at the Oxford Center of Islamic Studies, he studied Islamic moral and theological frameworks. And from 2013 to 2015, as a Templeton Foundation scholar, he led a national survey of Muslim physicians bioethical attitudes and professional experiences. His current areas of research in cancer screening, end-of-life care, neuroscience, and theology are all funded by the Templeton Foundation and the American Cancer Society. Um, without further ado, uh, please welcome Dr. Awesome Padella. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, Peggy. Thank you, it's Dr. Brown. And the Office of Health Equity and Inclusion, for bringing me back uh, here uh, to the University of Michigan to share with you some thoughts basically on the patient side of things. Uh, I know that uh, we have, are going to have several questions, so as Norman said, I'm going to kind of speed through some of the lecture, be a little bit provocative, so we can have a robust discussion at the end. Um, so to begin with, uh, you know, I, Norman mentioned that I lead here, let me stand here. Uh, I lead the Initiative of Islam and Medicine at the University of Chicago. And we see ourselves residing at this junction between the healthcare system and the Muslim community. So we want to be individuals and a research program that looks at the religious influences of Muslim health behaviors as they're lived out in the Muslim community, and that can lead to healthcare challenges and disparities. And then kind of cycle that back to the healthcare system so that it can accommodate those patient values and systems and needs. At the same time, we reside between the seminary and the academy along the axis of Islam, where we look at Islam as a lived tradition embodied by seminarians, who then are authors of the tradition as well, how they think about Islam, and then how the academy, Islamic Studies Academy, thinks about Islam as a lived tradition, but one that is practiced within the communities. Our project is one of translation between all of these stakeholders, so that hopefully we can lead to a more holistic understanding of the intersection between the Islamic tradition and biomedicine in large. So, so with that said, today I'm going to just speak about the healthcare system and the Muslim patient experience access here. Particularly, we're going to talk about the concept of healthcare accommodations. Uh, and then I'm going to give you some data from a series of studies that we did on Muslim communities here in Michigan and in Chicago that talk about what healthcare accommodations mean to them and what it would look like for the healthcare system. We're then going to put on the ethics hat that I wear and talk about the ethics of accommodating religious worldviews in healthcare, largely for a second in light of the four principal framework, which many medical students learn, are indoctrinated in, in medical school, and then kind of practically at the ground level from the vantage point of healthcare system decision makers, when they have to adjudicate between different preferences and priorities. Then I'm going to leave you, hopefully, at the end, with some greater understanding about Muslim patient healthcare needs, but really I hope you leave here challenged. 
and challenged but motivated to bring about a patient-centered, equitable, and holistic healthcare system here at University of Michigan, and then when you graduate, wherever you go. So I'm an emergency medicine doctor, right? This is where I spend some of my time in the ED uh, with a lot of different power differentials and patients often leaving uh, bewildered of what happened. So I'm gonna start with a case, as we do often, from the ED. So here's a patient. Um, this is a 35-year-old female who presents with a headache. This is the triage note. Uh, that she was jet skiing in Lake Michigan. There was an accident. There was a, uh, no nausea or vomiting that she reports, n questionable LOC. Uh, and she has no weakness but a little a moderate uh, headache. Those are the vital signs. And then she, uh, she comments uh, to the nurse at the intake, so she walked in, she was ambulatory, that she would like to see a female clinician. So assuming that you're in a single pod ED, all right, um, what would you do? Would you try to find a colleague who's a female to see this patient? So what I'm going to do in this beginning part of the talk is have you raise hands uh, on various questions, and then in the end, we're going to talk about what that means. So here's a question. You're a physician and a single pot ED. Would you try to find a female colleague to see this patient? Yes or no? Those, those say yes, raise your hand. Okay, those say no. And the rest of you are unsure. Okay. All right. So, so if the patient wasn't that patient, but it was this patient, and she wanted to see a female physician, would you try to go find one? Raise your hand, yes. Ah, you guys don't like Hillary, okay. <laughs> All right, well, I thought I was in a blue state. Anyway, um, uh, who would say no? A couple of people, and the rest of you unsure. What if this gentleman came in and said, I want to see a, a male physician? Would you go try to find one? Raise your hand and say yes. And uh, no? All right. We'll just stuck, stick with yes because people don't want to say no. What about if this individual said they want you to see a, a male doctor? Who would say yes? Raise your hand. Okay. Who would say no? All right. So I'm going to flip this and I'll tell you what I saw here. I saw here um, when we were raising our hands that actually people would accommodate this individual more than Hillary, right? And this was the least accommodated, okay? And no one said, there's a couple people up front who said no to many different requests, but no one said no, okay? So now I'm gonna change it. So what if this person said, I wanna be seen by the chief of emergency medicine? Who would say yes, I'll find the chief or this? the department chair or whoever else it is. Yes? Hmm, okay. And what if this individual said that I want to be seen by a full professor, none of these residents or medical students? Raise your hand. A few. And this individual said I want to see by a white doctor. Raise your hand. Okay. So, so, so they're very patient-centered healthcare system you know, there are differences that in the way that we think about different types of accommodations or requests, right? That's just clear and apparent. So just so who wasn't, who you weren't here privileged to see, there were some people who would say yes, right? Here, uh, less here, and almost only a couple people here, okay? So, so the question really for us is then, or, or, or one level is, you know, can patients ask for a specific provider type that should we accommodate that request, right? But the real question, I think, are what are the considerations that influence our decisions? Because clearly, we make different decisions on different types of requests based on what? So I'm going to now ask you guys to kind of give me some ideas of the second question. What considerations influence your decision about just the scenario I put out here of accommodating that request? Religious beliefs? In what way? Like if the value was a religious one, you would, like what would that do? I'm sorry? It goes up, so you're higher priority. Okay. Other thoughts? Explain what that means. So I think you're saying you want to try to right the social wrong, is that what you're saying? So you want to be helping the more, the less empowered become more empowered. 
and those who are already empowered, you feel less inclined. Okay, other thoughts? have a lot of implicit assumptions and biases into your decision making, right? You're not going to be able to necessarily know what, the, what that's coming from. So, but I think your points are all valid. Last comment, and then I'm going to kind of move on. Is there any, anybody else want to share some other reason or other consideration? Go, go ahead. Acuity, but largely this is where the debate lies. The patient values that lead to a preference request that you assume exist or don't exist or they tell you they exist, or, and the provider values regarding the request. So you can imagine a scenario where someone who is the only female in a medical class, the only person who got into neurosurgery, right, and now is being told, ask, by, I want to see a male doctor. How would that go, right? So there are also other things that happen internally to us as providers where we make value judgments about what the patient is saying or not saying. So we're going to talk about that. One of the things I said I want to introduce this term of healthier accommodations. These are two different ways that people define it. You know, cultural adaptations that would make patients more comfortable in the healthcare setting, simple definition, or modifications in healthcare that will be based on patient values. So the idea of patient embeddedness is sort of part of the definition. And I, I would think this is, this is from those who are in this field who know this is a model um, of reducing healthcare disparities and uh, improving cultural competence to reduce healthcare disparities. But here, accommodations lies at the intersection of all of these, right? So at one level, you're trying to think about, as a, a, the, my colleague here said, the in, underserved in society. How can you right the wrongs? How can you be more socially just towards them? So you, part of that would involve making accommodations the way that you deliver healthcare. If you want to target a cultural population, you know they have certain types of beliefs and values. Right, we have a Japanese family health program here. Right? There's different ways that the clinic runs because of their value system. And so that is cultural targeting to a patient population. Maybe they're not underserved right, in that case. Um, you have this idea of patient-centeredness that we all talked about. We want to have an idea of what can we do to improve uh, the patient outcomes, what's the best way of delivering health care. Then again, it leads to some sense of accommodations. Large, and then lastly, this big thing, that amorphous term that has been defined in many different ways and to different people that means different things, but this idea of cultural competence, right, also leads to accommodations. Because yes, you have knowledge, but then it needs to be applied in some sort of way. So it resides at this intersection of all these different streams of thoughts and ideas that are pervading medical care delivery today. But the question always is, what values do we accommodate? To what extent and how, right, and how? So the rationing of cultural accommodations is a hot topic that many people don't talk about. But as bioethicists, and I am of that clan, I guess, and the, and the guild, we need to think about. So I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about what you all brought me here to talk about, Muslim patient care and Muslim patient uh, needs. So we're going to switch gears, but then return back to this question about the ethics of cultural accommodations. So Muslims are diverse, right? The estimates are there are 5 to 7 million Muslims in the United States presently. Um, they're ethnically and racially diverse. So these are some statistics from various different uh, groups that about a quarter of them are African-American, a quarter South Asian-American, and a quarter Arab. 
Um, they have a diverse immigration history. Most, right, so the dominant, uh, so the dominant component of the American Muslim population presently is immigrant population, foreign born, but a sizable uh, minority here are native. And then you see that they, all of these three components, these ethnic uh, and racial components, have a different history. Right? So African Americans, there are some scholars, uh, some actually from University of Michigan, who would note that nearly 20% of the individuals who were brought here in the slave trade came from Muslim country, countries of origin. There are actually these amazing stories of individuals who then would try to keep up their prayer and recitation of the Quran and various hidden means. But that was discarded, that was lost, that tradition was lost. You have Arab and South Asian uh, immigrants who came here in the 19th and 20th century. Here we have the Ford. Uh, uh, Ford brought a lot of Arabs from Lebanon, Syria, and Michigan, right, in the early uh, 1800s or so. Then you have African American, African immigrants more recently, we know that from like Somalia, or at least in my life, and Somalia, other places that came here as migrants. They have different histories, different socioeconomic backgrounds, but what ties them together is this notion of an Islamic identity. So we should know there's some myths about American Muslims, uh, because largely because of the media and how we think about it. But most Americans are English literate. Nearly 87% are English literate. So when we think about healthcare accommodations, a lot of times people think about cultural and linguistic competency. The linguistic is emphasized. But here, for this population, there isn't a problem about speaking English largely. For the newer refugees, potentially, but most of the people who came here as skilled laborers or have college degrees. They don't, really, they don't, they don't need you to help them understand big terms. Um, as far as house, household income, you'll note here that most Americans on the lower spectrum, right, so there are a lot of refugee populations that have come recently uh, that are on the lower spectrum, higher than the general population of the United States. But in terms of those who are uh, socially mobile in the upper spectrum, nearly the same amount of people have household incomes over 100,000 as a regular American population. This population is very religious, right, so they're highly religious. You see this breakdown between Sunni and Shia. 65% Sunni, 11% Shia. 69% uh, say that religion is a very important part of their life compared to 58% of Americans' general population. 65% are poor praying daily. And then this is a really high number. 50% attend mosque at least once per week compared to 36% of the regular population. So, you know, I say American Muslims. I'm talking about the Muslim aspect of identity. You should note, yes, that there is diversity. Yet compared to the general demographic here, they are more highly religious than other populations. So then when we get to the healthcare literature, the question becomes, what do we know, right? It's about American Muslim health disparities. You see here, Afra, who was a medical student now, she was an undergrad when I was here. We did this study a long time ago, trying to understand what's known about Muslim Americans uh, and healthcare disparities. And you see, this is what we found from our systematic literature review, that in this period, uh, from 1970 to 2009, there were only, if you did the search term in PubMed, you found two articles. And then if you added some other disparities terms, you found 10 articles. So that's the landscape. We know nothing, right? We knew nothing. And uh, my career has been trying to bring some light to these issues. Uh, uh, so I'll present some things here. The larger challenge is in studying American Muslim health disparities, because a lot of people come at cultural competence and healthcare, uh, from a healthcare disparity lens, from a social justice lens. Well, you'll know very little about this population then, because we can't get uh, national samples of American Muslims. Religious affiliation is not captured in national databases. Uh, not, not in the surveys that are done by ISR here or NORC at University of Chicago. Naming algorithms are unreliable. We've done some of this work where 9% capture rate or 25% capture rate. That means you can't do large survey sampling. It would cost millions of dollars. Uh, there is a mistrust of state actors. And what I mean by that is when you try to do community-based sampling, there was a big study done here, Detroit Arab uh, Area Survey, but you found this was palpable in the community. And when you try to do community-based, zip code-based, uh, perspective research, there's a distrust, and some people just opt out, so you get biased samples there. Uh, as far as assessing the Islamic component, right, so most of the measures of religiosity are based on Christian worldviews. They don't exactly fit well with Muslim worldviews, so these measures don't exist. This is a challenge, again, for myself and others who do this research. We have to create our own tools, and then validate them, so the, the, the line of uh, the, long, uh, the career span of doing one study becomes many, 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 many years. And largely, here just about religion, we don't know what we don't know. Right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that pervades our lives. It's every day in the media. But when we think about it in the healthcare system, it's something that we don't know what we don't know about religion and how that affects people's health care. Oftentimes, people don't take a good spiritual history. And then when we have 
these challenges about religion, sometimes religion is put forth as a challenge, but nothing is actually then thought about what that means to the individual. Yet, I will say there are clear ways in which religion can influence healthcare disparities amongst American Muslims. This is a paper uh, Far and I wrote a couple of years ago. And I'm just going to give you this overarching view as a model of how we think about uh, the, the religion influencing health, potential healthcare disparities. So one level is through beliefs. Right? So Islamic beliefs influence how you think about health, illness, and disease. So for, these are studies below. So there's a study about pregnancy. If you view pregnancy as a blessing, then that influences your attitude towards contraception. And that could lead to different health differences, right? Health care differences, delivery differences, quality of care differences. Or this idea that cancer is based on cause decree. Right? Then that ha influences attitudes and intentions towards preventive cancer screening. And that can influence health care disparities. On another sort of larger box, Islamic values and ethics. So the idea that Islam prescribes alcohol consumption can lead to decreased health risk exposure from alcohol consumption, right? Disease types and also injuries. Uh, this is well known in Mormons. There have been studies done in Mormons about alcohol and uh, tobacco use, that they have different health differences in that population because of these religious prescriptions. Similar things can be said about Muslims. This idea of gender components, which I start out with, you know, influences many healthcare seeking patterns. I mean, I'll show you some data. It's pretty striking. And then the idea, particularly where we live today in the United States, a Muslim identity exposes you to is a health risk exposure, I would argue, right, through discrimination, both societally and in the healthcare system. And that leads to delayed healthcare seeking behaviors as well. Again, some data I'll share with you in a few moments. So let's get to deconstruct that first sort of question by that uh, hypothetical Muslim female at the ED. She wants a same sex provider. So, what is the empirical data behind that? So I did a study here um, of 97 adult Muslims attending mosques because we wanted to get more religiously affiliated Muslims. We found that, uh, this is men and women, that 21% had delayed seeking health care due to lack of a same-sex provider. They reported, self-reported this idea. In Michigan, uh, in Chicago, I was focusing, I am focusing on Muslim women's health. So we did a larger sample from mosques and community sites. So this is not just going to the, where the you know, Muslims congregate in terms of worship, but rather going to sites like a women's resource center or a social service agency where Muslims interact in their daily living. Maybe they're not as religious, but we found 53% <laughs> delayed healthcare seeking because of not finding a, a, a they reported not finding a same-sex provider. So this went from a sample of the first one in Michigan where men and women, here this is just women. Right, 53%. And those, oh, the predictors for that, or the associations with those who had higher religiosity, high, obviously higher modesty levels, were less, uh, to, more likely to report delayed healthcare seeking. So, so that was really striking uh, to us, that, that in this population, you have a lot of preventive health things that, that can't occur if they're not going to go see a provider of the same gender. Right? Yet, largely, no one has done any research on this. So then we did some qualitative work, and we talked to individuals how this influences your thinking about the healthcare system. So uh, this is a, the first quote from a woman who was examined by a physician in the ED, and they have to do a vaginal examination. She sort of says what she remembers from that ED visit. She actually even doesn't remember why she was there. Well, she remembers why she was there, but she doesn't remember what happened, except for she remembers that exam, and she said, I wish the ground would have swallowed me up. That's how she feels about the ED and that, that, that examination. Uh, and there, there's another patient who... Very forth, this is an African American patient. I remember her, uh, and she 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 talks about the fact that she would wear a head covering and she'd go to a clinic, right? And she'd be and people would not want to assume who she is or what she is or, what, or whatever. And then so she's saying, it's not if I'm as if I'm the patient. I have to say, pay attention. I'm a Muslim woman. I have this modesty issue, right? Why do I have to sit here every time I go and say, look, you know, I want, you know, you can't just uncover me. You have to, I have to explain to them all the time, every time. Why can't they just know this at some point? Um, and then there was a Turkish individual who had spent, uh, I think, two or three months in a uh, rehab facility after having a stroke. And his remembering of that experience was that every day I have this ritual that, that sort of scarred me. The worst thing for me was being washed by a woman every morning. Like that's, you know, I had no family to help me, and that was my daily, um, daily dose of vulnerability. So that's the, kind of the empirical data. Let's talk a little bit about the Islamic bioethics piece, which I dabble in, about where this is rooted and how it comes from. So we wrote this paper that has a lot of things in it. I just put it up there because there's a lot of different things I talk about, and today I'm only going to talk about a few of these issues. But there, this, this idea of gender concordance is actually rooted within the tradition 
So it's not just a, 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 and some people would say this, oh, it's just, you know, as they get acculturated, you know, Muslims have this value system, so it's just a cultural thing in patriarchal societies. But rather, it is part of a parcel of the religious teaching. So the, the Qur'an, the scriptural sources of Islam, one of them is the Qur'an, believed to be the word of God. It tells both men and women to lower their gaze and guard their modesty. And there's a commandment, you know, do not go, la zina, do not go near adultery. So the Prophet Muhammad, the other source of sort of scriptural source is his sayings, his teachings, and his, uh, his tacit approvals. He made many statements, some of these here are sure, that speak to this idea of, uh, of, of modest cross-gender interaction. He says that every religion has an innate character, the character of Islam is modesty. And he commands that, you know, unrelated man and woman must not remain alone in the same space. So from these and other scriptural sources, you have legal scholars who then explicate the boundaries of cross-gender interaction in the healthcare system. And this is what, this is nearly a consensus from scholars on this issue. So they say, again, with this big caveat, if all else is equal, and we can talk about that in the Q&A, but if all else is equal, you know, uh, the physician's choice hierarchy is based on this notion of modesty. So a Muslim man or a Muslim woman should pick a Muslim of the same gender and then a non-Muslim of the same gender. Right, so the gender modesty issue. Then if after that, then the Muslim, then the religion issue. If a Muslim of the opposite gender and a non-Muslim of the opposite gender. So, so the modesty issue pervades, in this case, you see the religious issue. And the reason that Muslims would want to see Muslim physicians or that the scholars say that you should is because when you have a malady that can impact your worship activities, like going to the Hajj or praying or fasting, that a Muslim physician should know when your illness is sufficient cause for you to not have to do those things. So that's why they talk about the religious uh, notion here. But you see, the first thing they talk about is the modesty issue. Um, and why? Well, because one of the arguments made is because of this religious concept of awra, about parts of the body that must remain, remain covered in front of different audiences. So when men are with men, there's a different, or Muslim men are with uh, men, there's a different level of covering that's required. When Muslim men are with relations, there's a different level. And then when Muslims are or Muslim men or women are in a general audience at a different level. So it's, I'm just going to mention the last level because that's what's most pertinent to the health encounter. And this is the consensus, again, of, of scholars that from a prophetic statements and practices that men should, in a general space, should always be covered between the navel and the knees and plus and minus the shoulders, and women, you know, the entire body save for the hands and face. Now, there are, that's the general idea of what your dress code should be. Obviously, there are exceptions from that when you have extenuation circumstances, like in the healthcare encounter. But if you think about the normative, this is a normative, that this is how our body should be covered, right? So this is our expectations of how we interact with the world for those who are more religiously inclined. Then you can understand why this modesty issue becomes very pervasive in wanting to seek a same-sex provider, right? Because there are parts of your body that you wouldn't uncover otherwise. This other idea about seclusion, um, also I mentioned that prophetic statement. So here, this idea of unrelated members of the opposite sex should not be alone. And this can potentially in the healthcare system be broken, right, when you have uh, the idea of potentiality. And as far as my understanding, when I interact with Jewish colleagues, similar things happen in the Orthodox Jews, where there's a potentiality idea. So if a door is slightly ajar, then it's not closed. The potential for someone to walk in without you knowing, so there will... You know, that, that that's, or that there's a, a, a curtain so people can hear. So you're not totally secluded in a private space. The potential for people to do walk in or open or listen in is what allows seclusion to be broken. So you can have that idea. It's not that it has to be fully enclosed and no one can see or talk or hear. Because obviously in the healthcare system, we're trying to balance privacy with modesty, right? And then and this last thing, so, so about physical context, so we talked about uncovering and, and parts of the body that need to be covered. This idea, these are, and I'm not sharing with all, you all the scriptural sources for lack of time, but members of the, so there's two dominant streams, or two dominant opinions about interaction with members of the opposite sex who are not related to you. One line of reasoning and rationale and scholars would say that there is no possibility, right? So members of the opposite sex should not have any physical contact except for a dire necessity, right? And they would say yeah, medicine, medical care is a dire necessity, but that's the normative, that no contact. Another group of scholars would say, well, you know, this is a conditional idea based on different interpretation of scriptural sources that yes, you shouldn't, but it's not, this is, you shouldn't have it, but the reason that you shouldn't have this interaction is because there's a fear of provoking of sexual desire uh, or there's enjoyment of the contact. So if that's not there, those are not those conditions aren't present. Then that's a relaxed ruling. Okay. Um, 
so that's the religious sort of substrate which might play a role in the cultural, cultural and practical mores of the individuals that you might see from the Muslim uh, community. Again, not all of them, but some of them. So then the question becomes, should we accommodate the same provider request? Right? Does that help you think in any sort of way what the patient values are? And should we do so? So I said I want to talk a little bit about the four principles. I particularly uh, am a critical of the four principles, but we'll talk about them very briefly. So let's, let's talk about this idea. Okay, well, you know, should we accommodate the patient same-sex provider request from the sense of the four principles? So, so if you think about the idea of respect for autonomy, that autonomy is part of personhood, uh, maybe the most important part of personhood, individuality. Autonomous choice is the main way by which individuals can, have, uh, can act out that essential characteristic of being a human or a person. Then that respect for autonomous choice should say that you should accommodate that request. They can at least make, if you can, right? But you should take that, weigh that, and okay, try to accommodate that because they're making an autonomous choice about their own body and their healthcare system and how they want to drive to the healthcare system. From a sense of social justice, you might say, well, they're marginalized, you should help them. Or you could say, well, you know, uh, can we do that for everybody? Are we going to have segregated healthcare systems for different types of people? That doesn't seem quite right. So potentially we shouldn't be thinking about accommodating this as a general practice. In terms of respect for person, right, or respecting her values, another idea that's embedded within this autonomy at times, or some say is a super category and autonomy is the, 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 the specific category, Again, same issue here. And as far as non is, I just showed you some data that would give you pause to think that there is some psychological harm that can happen to individuals, right, that does impact the healthcare seeking in this population afterwards. So in terms of that mode, we have to at least consider that we should be trying to accommodate this request when we can, right? So we, uh, it's supposed to be a positive there. But we should try. Um, but again, this is the issue, right? That do we have all these other factors uh, that can, do we have resources and what's the patient acuity? So let me give you a sense. Uh, so I've been studying these things for a long time. Actually, I have patient and provider level of data to share with you. So we did a study of, of physicians um, in the ED. And we asked them the question uh, with different patient scenarios, right? How, what's the percentage of time that you've been asked as a physician to accommodate same gender, same race, and same religion by a patient? These are ED physicians. Uh, at, we did the study at ASEP, which is our American College of Emergency Physicians. So you see this, that the, the request in the ED for gender is, is quite common. These other things less common, but higher than we would have thought initially, okay? So then we said, okay, well, how do you, what would you do? What's your perception from the provider level, right? So would you, would you always accommodate or would you never accommodate this request? And the most polarizing one was gender as well, and not predicted by gender of the physician, right? That there's some people, would, a third would almost always accommodate that request no matter what it is, who it's coming from, if they're male or female. Some would almost never so the, the race and the religion one was less. So you see that this is something that is quite common in the ED, yet it is polarizing within our own practice, within our own profession. Okay, so I'm going to take a turn now and talk largely uh, about the larger ideas of healthcare accommodations that Muslim patient populations seek from the data point. So we did this study while I was here at UFC, or U of M uh, and during my RWJ years, and we had this report about meeting the healthcare needs of American Muslims. So we did 13 focus groups in Michigan, right, uh, again in the South Asian, Arab, and African American communities because we wanted to get diversity across the Muslim demographics, and we had 102 people in these focus groups. And the question at the end of this focus group was, this was almost verbatim the question, what changes, if, we said, if the healthcare system had $100,000, to spend on you all, what changes would you like to see in the hospital to make you feel more comfortable? And across these focus groups, we, uh, said what, we had them do a rank sorting exercise where they had to come up with three. They had a list of 15. Tell me the three that you want this hospital or that hospital to give. So that's how we analyze the data. The most common uh, accommodations were gender concordance as far as possible. Both men and women said this. We had males and females in these focus groups. Um, it was top three in 11 of the focus groups in, all, in 12 of the 13 that was, uh, that was mentioned. Halal food was the second thing. Uh, and then you see this idea of neutral prayer space. So I'm going to give you a little sense of what they said about each of these things. We talked about gender, so I'm going to stop talking about that. But let's talk about halal food. 
So the way in which the, the focus group discussants talked about this was this idea of that because it's religiously uh, mandated to eat in certain ways, that that has to be the best food source, that is healthier in some sort of way. And then they noted that, well, if it's healthier, if we believe it's healthier, the absence of this during our convalescing period in the healthcare system seems problematic, right? So it should be helping us and making us, giving us better nutrition to get healthier quicker, but oftentimes healthcare systems don't provide it. And particularly we're in Michigan, so there was this issue of the social justice issue, and they, people experience this as potentially discriminatory, right? So all I get is a vegetarian. Every time I ask for halal food, oh, we have vegetarian. But I mean, everybody else gets meat except for us, and they would say, we have, they're vegan, they have low fat this, they have low sodium that, they have this or that renal diet, but they can't figure it out when we have 23,000 Muslims in this area to get halal food in the healthcare system. So, so it was seen as, 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 a, uh, as a potentially discriminatory practice. You see, you'll see this come up again. So about neutral prayer space, right? So again, the idea here that prayer itself is a healing, a source of healing, that Muslims have spiritual needs, and these, uh, this involves when they're in the hospital, that they should be able to go and pray. And oftentimes, most of the chapels in these hospitals have religious iconography that that's of a certain, uh, you know, certain Christian in origin that makes it difficult for them to feel comfortable in that prayer space. Then this idea of the social repercussions, right? So this is an this is a, uh, individual sort of saying, you know, we were praying, and we couldn't pray there, so we went and prayed in the room. And the nurses and security, everybody came in and asked if everything was okay, right? Doctors were hesitant to come back in the room. Everybody came by after I looked at in the door. We were just praying how we pray. So like it becomes a big commotion. Oh, what's going on here? Why are these four people praying? Why are they lining up? What's going on? Especially when you have the person next door to you on the other side of that room. So so it wasn't comfortable to pray in the room either. Yet there was no place for them to go pray. Uh, in, the, in the hospital. So those are the accommodations, right? Data-driven, that they say. Gender coordinates as far as possible, uh, halal food, and then a neutral prayer space. Um, then the question for us, Seth, is this. I want to stop very shortly with some, some comments here. So, okay, this is what we know, but how, what, are we going to accommodate these values? Like, what extent and how, how are we going to do that? So let me give you just a, a few thoughts uh, to promote our conversation that's going to happen now. When you think about what values, right, so I, I made this idea that the same-sex provider accommodation is something that impacts health care seeking behaviors of Muslim Americans, right? It's something that they leave with, if there is not accommodated, they leave with a sense of, of psychological harm, potentially, some of them. And in our health care system, we do this, actually, we accommodate this value in different ways. So, for example, you know, in the ED, we have uh, victims of rape, and we call in the same nurses to do ex data collection and examination, recognizing that this might be a very troubling time to have an opposite sex provider do intimate examinations in, in history. So we have trained a system of nurses who get called in to do this exam, and we provide resources for that. In the labor and delivery, yes, we don't have, and this is a case here at University of Michigan, uh, there was an issue about this uh, many years ago, but, but you know, we, we accommodate to the best of our ability when a woman says, I just want to have females in the room, right? Sometimes we put things outside the room, men don't go in, okay? It's a population that we get good reimbursement for. And we do that, not that we say exclusionally, but we do that, we try to. You know, the question is now, what do we think that's a religious motivation underlying that? Do we have the same level of attention to that value? It's the same, potentially the same accommodation on the ground, but a different underlying patient value and provider perception of that value, right? And then this idea, as I mentioned to you, now if you think that the patient is saying, I want a male because they don't think women can be doctors from where they come from or whatever else it is, is that something that we're going to accommodate or not? Are we going to try to right that wrong or educate them? So, so I'll share with you, you know, I was a, when I was a resident at the University of Rochester and, you know, I had two incidences when I had two incidences when a patient said, when I was in training, I don't want to be seen by a terrorist. One of my attendings said, Awesome, you're not gonna go and take care of that patient, we're gonna find some other resident. Another attending said, we went and started to reprimand that you get whoever you have, you, you this is not Burger King, you know, the all common physicians taking care of, of patients. They had very different responses to that. And I had my own obviously internal responses, but the healthcare I was a trainee. And you see here, we do that at times as well. There's a perception of what's happening, and then we either feel it's our responsibility sometimes to educate patients, or we say, we gotta be totally in service of the patient. Let's not raise the issue now. They're vulnerable. 
Um, then to what extent, right? So, so we talk, okay, you know, at a patient, if I have a physician to take care of, of the same sex next to me, we'll accommodate that, right? Maybe in the outpatient setting, we can accommodate that. I have clinics that just, you know, female clinics, or whatever, women's health clinics. Um, then what about wars? To what extent, right? There are countries that have gendered wards, right? And there was, the NHS actually had a big issue about this, about creating these spaces. Do we do that here? And how, why do we think about that? That's a bigger, right? One provider to then one clinic to now award. And where does it stop? And what are the different negotiations we have to make uh, from the ethical space to do this? The similar thing here about, we talk about neutral prayer space. That was in a request. But what if these patients that we need, chaplains who are Muslim? And there's one who was formerly, I think, chaplain here, sitting in the room. But what if they said that? And we need to have a system to train them, right? We need to adjudicate what that means in the tradition. Are we invested to create that professional character for them? It doesn't sound intrinsic to the Muslim tradition, just so you know. But are we going to go that far? Are we going to just have people come and visit whoever, whatever qualifications they have? Again, what extent? If we recognize it's a need. And then the la last thing is how, so how, right? I pick on this halal food issue because it's, it's one that I think even the Muslim community is challenged. So, so for example, there are different ways people view halal food, right? There are different regulations at times. Yes, there's a base. But are we going to say we're going to do the lowest common denominator approach, that what someone says is okay and it's easily accessible, we can do that. Are we going to go to the stringent level approach, right? right. Are, what, 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 how, right? Are we going to take what can meet everybody's needs or what is the most, right? And that could be something that's very expensive or what will meet someone's needs and it's very easy, calmly had. Um, so, and then lastly, I think, which communities do we invest resources for? Right, so we have a history in the United States of trying to, right, of racism, right, of of sexism, of a lot of things, and we are trying as an enlightened population to right those wrongs historically. But what are the wrongs of today, and are we going to wait 30 years to correct them as well, or do we have to have advocates for that later on, right, or is the time now to make it for everybody, actually have a responsible, a responsive system that has its own value system. Right? That is not, that meets patients where they are at. And that will be challenging for the profession. Because your character will be different then. You will have a different formation if that's what you want to do. I think that's the struggle. That we are trying to apply banded measures to a, a cultural phenomenon and problem in the society. And unless we grapple with that, that culture change, and I think everything else is piecemeal. So as I said, I'm going to leave you with some provocative comments. I want to stop there with one last slide to give you some hope that we can do things in our own practice every day. So this is a, a very elementary model of healthcare disparities, but only here to promote what we can do as a provider at the one and all on level. So if you think there are three things here, and this is the last slide, that, that can inform healthcare disparities, which we may know or may not know for different populations. One thing, step one, I think, would be for us to work on our implicit biases, right, our own stereotypes, do some internal work. Right, to think about, well, can I eliminate that amongst myself? I'm an easy doctor, and I don't like people come to, you know, I had very scarring experiences with, with alcoholics who came in and kind of you know, hit me over the head, so now I don't like them, whatever it is, right? So are you going to eliminate your own biases the next time you see an alcoholic and not think of the last one who kind of hit you on the head, All right? There are other things, as you can imagine. Or, right, so there's cultural linguistic barriers, right? We have this idea that we're going to give telephones or have uh, uh, interpreters. Can we actually step back and recognize that we have our own culture and the values that the patient has, we have to explicate, right? So in, in the models of the patient-doctor relationship, you know, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, a long time ago, the, the third model is deliberative, where the patient's an advisor, uh, the physician's an advisor or moral guide. We actually elicit their values and then have a debate and dialogue around whether, what healthcare action meets their values. What does that mean? You have to actually go into where they're at and have them explicate for you and challenge them at times. Do we have that level of rapport with our patients? Do we do that, right? Can we deliver patient-centered care at that level, not some other uh, idea? And then lastly, this idea of promoting workforce diversity for many reasons, and this will be talked about in my second lecture uh, this afternoon. But this idea of workforce diversity, we have a lot to work on as well. But I think that at least starts to have some sense of concordant relationships, some sense of social uh, connectedness amongst the healthcare workforce and accepting everybody else, that can create a tolerant healthcare system. A accepting is a different level, but at least a tolerant healthcare system. So with that, I'll end for questions. I know I went over my own 35 million time, so go ahead, please. Thank you.